Hi, my name is Zara Jamal, and I'm a professor of anthropology and gender studies at the University of Chicago, where I teach on international women's rights. I'm here to tell you today about women at the beginning of faith, focusing on the faith of Islam. And I'm going to be talking to you about Bibi Khadija, who was the Prophet Muhammad's first wife and the first convert, the first Muslim. Many Muslims believe that Islam would not have been possible without Khadija because she provided great support to her husband, the Prophet, in a lot of different ways, intellectually, financially, physically, and otherwise. And although there are a lot of biographies about the Prophet's life, there is very little that's actually written about his wife. Um, there are a lot more books, stories, and pamphlets that have been written in the last 50 years or so that talk about her life, mainly in languages other than English. And a lot of them commemorate her as a role model, as an exemplary figure for Muslim women today. And they look to her for a variety of reasons. She was a great businesswoman. She was financially independent, had her own career. She proposed marriage herself to her husband and to someone who was 15 years younger than her and without a male intermediary or guardian, and that was something very unusual for her time. She was someone who also uh, lived a life of monogamy and had a great and equitable marriage with her husband, Muhammad. And she also lived a life of piety. Uh, she was very religious and prayed often, and she also gave much charity and generosity and compassion to the poor, the sick, and the needy. The Hadith, or the sayings of the Prophet, refer to her as a perfect woman or an exemplary Muslim woman. And she is equated, actually, with Maryam, or Mary, the mother of Jesus. In fact, in the Quran, the only woman who is actually mentioned by name is Mary. There is an entire chapter of the Quran that is named after her. And it refers to her as a woman of devotion to God, of chastity, of obedience, of purity. And because of these conceptions, Khadija, who also exemplified these characteristics, is equated with her. So what do we actually know about her life? And how can we use what we know about her life, some of the values that she espoused and lived, to inform our own lives, our, a life of, um, of value and um, of service to humanity? And that's what I'd like to talk to you about now. As I mentioned, she was a great businesswoman. She inherited great wealth from her father when he passed away. But it wasn't something that she just inherited. She actually preserved this wealth and expanded it to the, cent to the extent that she had the largest caravan in her entire tribe. And it was larger than all of the other caravans of everybody else in her tribe combined. Because of her nobility, her virtuous character, her wealth, her generosity, she was someone who was labeled as the princess of the Quraysh, the tribe to which she belonged. She also had the title of Al-Tahira, the pure. And because of her character, she received many wedding proposals. By this time, she was already widowed twice. And when these proposals came, she refused them. One day, she had the opportunity to have um, trade done on her behalf in Syria. She did not actually go on the trades herself, but sent others uh, to represent her and, and to trade goods for her. And she was looking for someone to go. She had heard about a man by the name of Muhammad, who was actually her distant cousin. And although he was not well versed in business, he had not been doing a lot of trading, he was known to be a man of virtue, a man of trustworthiness, a man of respect, and she decided to employ him. And when she sent him to Syria, she also sent with him a, another young employee by the name of Mysera. And so they set off on this journey. And when they went on this journey, Mysera had these interesting observations of various things that were going on. For example, at some point on the way, Muhammad stopped under a tree to take some rest. It was a very hot and long and arduous journey, and he needed a moment to himself. And as Mysera was observing this, a monk came up to him, a Nestorian monk. And the monk asked him, who is that man? And Mysera responded to him and said, well, his name is Muhammad, and he's from a particular tribe, and we're going on a trade for Khadija. And the monk tells him, nobody has stopped under that tree but a prophet. And Mysera took this information in thought it was interesting, and just kept it to himself, and they continued on the journey. They go into Syria, and it turns out that Muhammad, 
who does not have a lot of business experience, is able to double the profits of Bibi Khatija's goods. Mysura takes note of this, too. And on the return journey, he notes how hot and difficult the journey back is. The sun is beating down on them, and everybody is straining um, and just really having a difficult time. And it seems that Muhammad is having no trouble. And so Mysura looks closer, and what he sees is that there are the wings of two angels that are covering him and protecting him from the sun. Mysura notes this, too, and he files it into his brain. And when they come back to, uh, to meet with Khatija, he takes her aside and he tells her what he had observed with the two angels, of what the monk had told him about the tree and that only a prophet had been under it, and of the amount that Muhammad was able to procure for her goods. Khatija then goes to talk to her cousin. Her cousin is named Waraka. He was an older man, um, a Christian, who was very learned, and he had copied uh, the Bible into multiple different languages. And he, he was someone who was also of great virtue and someone who was uh, praised and, and looked to for, for his knowledge in the community. And she goes to him and she tells him everything that has happened. Um, about the trade, about the angels, about the tree, all of Mysura's observations, and even her own interactions with, with Muhammad. And Waraka, her cousin, turns to her and says, you know, there is a prophet that is due at this time, a prophet who is meant to be the successor to Moses and to Jesus, a prophet who is referred to in the Torah and the Bible, and I think that Muhammad is this prophet. Khatija takes this information and she reflects on it and she then decides that she is going to propose marriage to Muhammad. Now at this time she was 40 years old. She was a widower twice over and this was not a common thing to do at all. But she sends word to him through one of her female relatives to propose marriage and his response is that, well, I don't have money to get married. I'm not in a position to support somebody. And the relative tells him, this woman who's proposing marriage is of great nobility. She is of great wealth and virtue. You don't need to have any money. And when he asks who it is and hears that the response is Khatija, he accepts right away and he moves into her home. Now, many Muslims believe and many scholars of Islam say that Khatija actually had foreknowledge from God that she was meant to marry Muhammad and that she was meant to protect and support him. In fact, that was the key reason why she had refused other wedding proposals when she received them. And that was also the reason that she took these signs that she heard from Mysura, the things that she talked to Waraka about, in order to confirm that these were in fact signs from God, that this was the man that she was meant to marry, and this was the man that she was meant to support. There are other scholars who talk about how she was the hujjat, or the prophet, the proof of the, of the prophet's um, uh, role of, of being um, the next messenger of God. And there are others who say that it was because of her that he was able to become a master of his time and to be able to bring the message to the people. She's therefore labeled one of the women of, of paradise, and it was through her that his prophethood was confirmed, and through her relatives and friends who were Christians that also confirmed his prophecy. Through their marriage, she was a loving wife and also um, a mother. In fact, she was the only one of his wives. He had other wives after she passed away. She was the only one, with the exception of one person, to bear him children. And for this reason, she is seen to be a symbol of virtue and purity. And again, she is equated with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Throughout their marriage, Muhammad would go often to a cave nearby Mecca, a cave uh, in Mount Hira, in order to meditate. He was troubled by a lot of the challenges of life around him, the kinds of um, things that people in the tribe would do that he did not uh, believe were correct. And he wanted to be with God, so he went to meditate. One day, when he was 40 years old, he heard a voice. 
And the voice told him to read, read in the name of God. And he was frightened. He didn't know what to do, who this voice was, where it was coming from. Was it, was it a demon? Was it a person hiding somewhere? What was happening? And this episode continues, and he has a conversation with this voice. The voice was from the angel Gabriel, the same angel who had been in communication with Moses and with Jesus before him. And this was the time of the first revelation. It occurred on the night of Qadr, the night of power. And he goes home and he's frightened because he's not really sure what this episode is about, if it was real, if he was imagining things, if it was a hallucination, what it was. And as he's hurrying home to his wife, Khadija, all of the rocks, the mountains, the trees, one by one, they bow down to him and they say, peace be upon you, messenger of God. So Muhammad is, is scared, he's fearful, he's wondering if these are hallucinations that he's received. And on his way back home, he's hurrying back to Khadija to, to, to tell her what happened and also just to, to, uh, to feel safe and comfortable. On his way back, all of the trees, all of the rocks, the mountains that are nearby, one by one, they're bowing down to him and they're saying, peace be upon you, O messenger of God. And this makes him all the more nervous. And he, he runs, he runs home, and he runs into her embrace. And he's shivering, and he's crying, and he's trembling out of fear. And she covers with a, him with a blanket, and she comforts him, and she calms him down. And when he's ready, he tells her what happened. He tells her about the voice that he heard, and what that voice told him to read in the name of God. And he expresses his fear, and she tells him, she tells him that she thinks that he is the prophet. She tells him that God would never disgrace him. He is a man of great character, of virtue, someone who takes care of the poor and the sick, someone who takes care of his relatives and others, and that God would never do anything bad to him. She tells him, that she believes that he is the next prophet, the prophet of this nation that everybody has been waiting for. She tells him what Mysara had told her. She tells him what her cousin Waraka had told her. And she tells him that she had been advised nearly 20 years prior that she was to marry him and to be his protector and his companion. And she becomes then the first Muslim and she says, I bear witness to you, O messenger of God, Muhammad. The prophecy continues. He continues to get revelation after this. But in the beginning, he is still unsure about Gabriel. He's unsure, is this an angel or is this a demon? And he expressed his, his lack of surety to his wife, Khadija. And she tells him, you know, the next time that Gabriel comes to you, Tell me, and I will help, de help you determine if he is an angel or a demon. Shortly thereafter, Gabriel arrives. He arrives with an another revelation from God for Muhammad. And Muhammad turns to his wife and says, Khadija, Gabriel is here. And she tells her husband, come and sit next to me. Come sit by my left thigh. So he comes over and sits next to her. And she asks him, do you still see Gabriel? And he responds, yes, I do. She then instructs her husband to come over to her right side and sit next to her right thigh. And she asks him, Muhammad, do you still see Gabriel? And he says, yes, I do. She then tells her husband to come and sit in her lap. And she embraces him. She loosens her robe and unveils herself. So there is just her slip between her and her husband. And she asks him, Muhammad, do you still see Gabriel? And he says, no, I don't. And she tells him, rejoice. Rejoice in God because this is indeed an angel. Only an angel would leave during an intimate moment between a husband and a wife when a woman who is nearly naked is in a moment of modesty. Only a demon would remain in these kinds of circumstances. So at this point, she again affirms his prophethood, and she also affirms that Gabriel is indeed an angel from God 
who is the, um, the angel who is bringing the revelation from God to Muhammad. The prophethood continues, the revelations continue, and throughout this period, Muhammad faces great persecution, great difficulty, as you can imagine that there would be many people, especially those of stature and of wealth and of power, who would feel threatened by him, or who would believe that, no, there is no new religion, there is no new revelation. We worship our idols and we are happy with our lives. Who are you to bring something new to our tribe? And throughout this period, she stands by him through all of this persecution and difficulty. And she uses the wealth that she has amassed throughout her life, through her trade, through her independence, in order to support Muhammad on his mission. And she also uses her money to uh, pay for the weddings of the needy, to support those who are sick or infirmed, to help those who are weak or in trouble. So she is a, a woman of great compassion and great generosity. God recognizes her generosity and he sends a verse to Muhammad in recognition of this. And he says to Muhammad, and God found you in poverty and made you free from need. He made Muhammad free from need by giving him Bibi Khatija. So Khatija, through her support of Muhammad, by offering him all kinds of compassion and generosity and support, also helped because of her stature in society. Because she was a woman of virtue and nobility, a lot of people paid attention to the things that she said and the things that she did. So among the earliest converts to Islam, among the earliest people to become Muslim, there were many women. And these women were actually members of tribes that were the fiercest opponents of Muhammad, including his most formidable enemy, Abu Sufyan. It was Abu Sufyan's daughter who was one of the earliest Muslims. As life continues, as Khatija is getting older, God sends the angel Gabriel to Muhammad again with another message. And Gabriel comes to Muhammad and tells him, Khatija is coming to you with some food. She's bringing you a bowl of some soup. When she brings it to you, tell her that there are greetings and peace upon her from God and also from me. And let her know that there is a special place in paradise for her, a place of gardens and jewels, a place where there is no noise and no tiredness, and this is prepared for her. And so Muhammad communicates this to his wife. In 619, Khatija passes away. This is about 10 years after the revelations began to her husband, the prophet Muhammad. This was a very difficult year for him because both his wife and his uncle who had raised him because Muhammad was an orphan, they both had passed away. And it's called the year of sorrow for Muhammad. When his wife passes away, he is heavily impacted. He even goes into the, the pit where she is buried himself in order to bury her with his own hands, to smooth over the dirt over her grave. And it is said also that when she passed away that there was not a single cent left from her wealth because all of it had been spent in support of the Prophet's mission. And in being generous to those in need. She had given everything away in charity. After she passed, she was given the title of Ummahat al-Mu'minin, the mother of the believers. And this is a reference to the Quran, uh, in which the, God says in the Quran that the Prophet is of an exalted status, as are his wives. After Khatija's passing, the Prophet Muhammad commemorates her in different ways. And there are different things that he says. I'd like to read a couple of these to you. He commemorates their loving and nurturing relationship, uh, their 25 years of marriage, by confirming her greatness. And he says, indeed, God has not replaced her with anyone better. She believed in me when I was rejected. When they called me a liar, she proclaimed me truthful. When I was poor, 
she shared with me her wealth. And God granted her children while he was withholding those from other women. It's said in another source that God comforted the Prophet Muhammad by her, by Khadija, when he went home. She was the one who gave him strength. She was the one who lightened his burden. She was the one who proclaimed his truth. And she was the one who belittled men's opposition. And for that reason, may God have mercy upon her. What does her life show to us? And what can we take from these stories to apply to our own lives, to live a life of, of value and of service to others? So what does her life show us? What can we learn from the stories of Bibi Khadija that I've told you? Well, I think we can take from her life that it was a life that was exemplary. It was a life of compassion, of good deeds, of honesty, of charity, of generosity, of unconditional love for God and for his messenger, who also happened to be her husband, the Prophet Muhammad. She was known to live a life of great piety and worship and also of good deeds, to give away her wealth to those in need. And for that reason, she was said to have achieved a rank of excellence that was far superior to the men of her time. She is remembered to be a devoted wife, a wonderful mother, a mother whose daughter was to marry the first male convert to Islam, Ali. And she is also remembered to be the one who supported the Prophet in his time of need and to provide him with great comfort and solace throughout his life and throughout his mission. We can take all of these things from her life and what we can also take is her respect for pluralism, for respect for others of other faiths. Remember that it was her cousin, Waraka, who also affirmed the prophethood of Muhammad and, Muhammad, and Waraka was a Christian. She had also gone to a slave by the name of Adas, who was also a Christian and who also affirmed the prophethood of Muhammad. So how can we apply the example of Bibi Khadija in our own lives, take the values that she lived and live them ourselves? And how can we use them to inform the service projects that you all are developing? I think it would help if we spoke for a moment about what it means to serve in Islam, service to humanity. In Islam, service is one of the pillars. It is something that began with the Prophet Muhammad and his wife, Bibi Khadija. They were great exemplars of giving to others. And what we know in Islam is that the purpose of life is to return to the divine origin, to God, and to leave the world improved. The way that we do this is both through prayer, but also through good deeds, through ethical action. And in acting ethically in the world, it means that we understand creation and we serve that creation. There is a concept in Islam, the social conscience of Islam, which enjoins us to ask not only what have I achieved, but what have I helped others to achieve? And I think we can see this very clearly in the example of Bibi Khadija. When we serve others, we are meant to do so in a way that improves their lives of living a life of dignity, of humanity, of peace and justice, so they become the masters of their own destinies and so that they can go forward and help others as well. And that's exactly what Bibi Khadija and the Prophet Muhammad tried to do. And I'm sure that in your service projects, you will move forward and develop projects that will do just that. Thank you so much, and may the peace and light of God be with you now and always.